Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W. We're continuing our discussion of World War II and the American home front. In the previous lecture, we talked about how the war created new opportunities on the home front for American women. In this lecture, we're going to talk about opportunities presented during the war for African Americans on the home front. Fighting a war against the Nazis and its racist ideologies forced many Americans to examine prejudice in their own nation and on the home front. Blacks, too, sensed the irony and pushed for greater equality during and, of course, after the war years. During the war, about a million African Americans served in the armed forces, and during the war, those forces remained segregated. But in the course of combat and out on the battlefield, there were many instances where the different segregated units would get blended together. And so there were plenty of instances uh, on the battlefield where blacks and whites fought side by side. And there are many instances in which blacks were celebrated for their combat service and for acts of heroism during the war. The most celebrated of these units was the Tuskegee Airmen a flight school specifically for blacks, which produced about 600 pilots over the course of the year. This is among the most highly decorated units of the entire war, winning many different awards. There were many other cases as well in which blacks served and fought heroically. And one of the developments in the post-war years is that white soldiers who fought side by side with black soldiers during the war often lowered their own kind of racial boundaries and helped to encourage the early stages of the civil rights era. Now, World War II was a time in some ways of increased opportunities for blacks on the home front as well, much as we discussed with women in the previous lecture. Jobs in the munitions factories offered an escape for many from the sharecropping system. And while it was not as extreme as during World War I, there was a, a sort of second wave of the Great Migration as thousands of blacks left the sharecrop farms of the South and moved to the North. There continued to be issues in the workplace, though, of racial segregation and a lack of equality in terms of opportunities and pay. In 1941, A. Philip Randolph who was a leading black activist and the head of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, a powerful black labor union, organized a march on Washington to protest racial discrimination in the defense industries. Now, the march itself never occurred, but in the course of negotiations with FDR himself, Randolph was able to convey the large number of blacks who intended to participate in the march and the prospect of a massive march against racism produced such an embarrassment for FDR that he actually released an executive order, 8802, before the march ever had to occur, which prohibited discrimination in the defense industries. The order read in part, there shall be no discrimination in the employment of workers in defense industries or government because of race, creed, color, or national origin. And so the march itself was no longer necessary and didn't actually happen, but it had the necessary effect of desegregating the munitions industries. Black unemployment dropped by about 80% during the war, and many did find employment in those defense industries. There were still issues, though, of unequal pay, most of the supervisors remained white, and there were still some racial incidents. But we can't deny that there was some progress made on the labor front as a result of this activity. Despite some of these gains, it must be said, though, that we still live in the pre-Civil War era, and that segregation and discrimination remained the most prominent features of racial relationships in the country during that time. The NAACP, seizing on the irony of fighting against racism and the Nazis abroad by launching the Double V campaign, double victory, victory abroad and at home over racism. They also mounted many legal challenges during the war years, 
that would come to fruition in the years after the war. Still, there remained many issues during the war. In one famous and notorious incident, Lloyd Brown, a black soldier in Kansas, was denied entry into a restaurant that at that very moment was serving German prisoners of war at the lunch counter. So it has to be said that the real benefits for African Americans would have to wait until later years. Having endured the same combat conditions as white soldiers, and by the end of the war fighting side by side with many of them, black Americans won't be the same after the war. If they can fight in the war, they should be able to eat at the same lunch counters. And so World War II contributed to the militancy of some African Americans that contributed to the civil rights movement in the years not long after the war ended. In a similar vein, there continued to be discrimination and mistreatment of a number of other groups as well. In one of the previous lectures, I talked about the Bracero program that welcomed back into the United States hundreds of thousands of Mexicans to fill much needed jobs in the agriculture industries in the Southwest. But those Mexicans were not always treated well. And as one example of how they might be mistreated, I'll mention the Zoot Suit Riots, which occurred in Los Angeles in the spring of 1943. The Zoot Suit was a fairly expensive costume popular at that time among some Mexican Americans and African Americans as well. It was a, a long, uh, elaborate sort of dress suit. The riots began after a series of separate incidents in which Mexican Americans clashed with American sailors at home on shore leave, probably over women or turf or something akin to that. After several such clashes, American sailors, with the permission of naval authorities and the Los Angeles police, began to make organized assaults on Mexican zoot suiters. These were kind of young gangs of Mexican who fancied themselves on the make. Such attacks escalated quickly until any Mexican on the street was subject to attack from the sailors. And even greater, until the sailors raided movie theaters and restaurants in search of victims. The reign of terror ended only when an order from Washington demanded that Los Angeles be closed to sailors and there would be no shore leave until the attacks stopped. So, in general, while World War II didn't result in the same kind of paranoia as World War I, there were definitely negative effects against certain groups in the country. There were advertising campaigns during the war that encouraged Americans not to talk too much. And as we'll see in the next lecture, this kind of discrimination and racism ultimately affected one group more than any other on the American home front, Japanese Americans.